All right, we're going to dig deep this morning. I know we have midterms coming up this week. And how many of us remember what we need to do to do good on our midterms? Does anyone remember? It's found in Education 124. It says, as a means of intellectual training, the Bible is more effective than any other book or all other books combined. And then she specifically says, if you study the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, it would actually give you even clearer understanding of what you need to know from science and other things of that nature. So I'm going to help you guys to get better grades on your midterm this week. Amen? <laughs> All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful that we could come together once again to study your words. And as we study deep this morning, Lord, into the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, I pray that you will help us get clarity, to know the way, Lord, go the way and show the way. We are living in very serious times, Lord. It's, the signs are all around us. We see that the movements are gathering, the world is gathering, Father, and I pray that at the same time that your people will be gathering. Amen. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Are we there together? And let's read together what it says in verse 1. Let's read it together. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. What is this saying? You know, we could get all caught up in the doctrine of Christ. You know, what is the nature of Christ? Is it before the fall? Is it after the fall? We get caught up in varying doctrines. But Paul is saying at some point, we're going to have to step away from the doctrine and go on unto perfection. In other words, he's saying that sooner or later, we're going to have to have some kind of experience of Christ and stop debating about doctrines here and doctrines there. When Christ comes, he's not going to look for who has the greatest intellectual knowledge. He's going to look for has, who has the greatest experience with him. So this text is saying that let's just not focus as much on doctrine as on experience. And that's what we want to share this morning. Now let's just do a quick recap. I always like to start it with this. Let's read it together. His eyes were as a flame of fire, which searched his children through and through. Then all faces gathered paleness, and those that God had rejected gathered blackness. Then all cried out. What did they cry out? Who shall be able to stand? Shall be able to stand? And what's the next question? Is my robe spotless? That's the question of questions. Who shall be able to stand? And where's that text found, by the way? Revelation 6 and verse 17. So it starts in 12 and it goes to 17. Who shall be able to stand? Is my robe spotless? Now, we mentioned that that text is found in what seal? The sixth seal. So that question is asked just before Jesus comes. Jesus comes in the seventh seal. So that tells us that right before Jesus comes, what he's going to be looking for is, who is able to stand in my presence? And then the question is, is my robe spotless? All right. And what does the robe represent, by the way? The Bible says in Revelation 19, the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So he says, is my character spotless? And then it goes on. The angel ceased to sing. And there was some time of awful silence when Jesus spoke. And what did Jesus say? Let's read it together. Those who have clean hands and a pure heart shall be able to stand. My grace is sufficient for you. So who stands? Those who have clean hands and, and pure hearts. So is this possible? And we claim that wonderful promise in 1 John 3. And then we ask the question, how do we get clean hands and a pure heart? 
And last week we shared this text in Revel in Daniel rather, chapter 8 and verse 14. And notice what this text says. Let's all read this together. In fact, we should be able to recite this without seeing it. And what does it say in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14? Together, and he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the cleansing of our hands and the cleansing of our hearts happens in the sanctuary. So do, does, does, does it seem then that we need to understand the message of the sanctuary? Does it seem then that we need to understand the experience that's necessary out of the message of the sanctuary? Because if we're going to stand, we have to stand through the lens of the sanctuary, and we must also stand with clean hands and a pure heart that's accomplished through the sanctuary. So what we want to do today is spend some time on studying the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. Now, do we, does this sound like something that's important? All right, let's start reading now. Let's start with Merger. And if you can read for us, this is from the book. Both of these statements are from Evangelism, page 221. Are you able to see? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> the correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. All right. Now, what stands out in a statement to you? Say, 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 it, say it again, Bailey. Correct so correct, right? Correct suggests that there's a what? There's an incorrect. So she didn't just say the understanding of the sanctuary or the understanding of Jesus' ministration. She says the correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. So as we mentioned last week, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 is the birth of the Seventh-day Adventist church. It was founded on this church, and it was done through careful study. William Miller studied this, these texts for many, many years before he came public. And through that, the Adventist movement was born, and then through that, the Seventh-day Adventist movement was born. It was all founded in this text. And that's why she says, the correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. All right, Dr. Hasi, if you could read this next statement for us. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Others, otherwise. otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time. All right. Now, today I want you guys to definitely interact, ask questions. This is, this is absolutely essential. And I want us to get this. So if, if there's for some reason you don't understand something or you need clarity on something, make sure that, that you ask the question. Now, I want you to notice as we look at this microscopically, the subject of two things, the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, should be what? Clearly understood by the people of God. Now, if for some reason it's not being clearly taught today or you're not clearly understanding, make sure that it's clear before you leave here. Ask questions. Then it says all, and then it uses a very strong word. What's the next word after all? Need. Need. That means it is absolutely essential. A knowledge for themselves of two things. What's the first thing? The position, position and work of our great high priest. The position and the work. Then it says, otherwise, it will be impossible to exercise the faith which is essential at this time. Now, as I look at this statement, and there's more to it, but I'll stop there for a moment because I'll personally ask a question at this point. And what question would I ask? What is a faith that is essential at this time? Now, we spend a lot of time covering what faith is and, and to a certain extent the faith which is essential at this time. But let's begin to look at what is a faith that is essential at this time. Now, what is faith, by the way? <laughs> Hebrews 11, one, I hear somebody quoting. Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, the reason why I tell you guys I love 1 John 3, 2 is because it's telling us something that we probably cannot necessarily see. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, now we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. So that means if we're going to see ourselves looking like Christ, as we look at ourselves, 
we see that it's not a match, right? If I look at me and I look at Christ, it's not a match. So the only way that I'm going to see myself looking like Christ is by seeing something by faith that I cannot currently see. Does that make sense? So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. How do we get that? By, by faith. All right, so what is a faith that is essential at this time? I want you to notice this most explosive statement that you've actually heard me quote quite a few times. And uh, this is still uh, Evangelism 221. It continues. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, and, and it's gonna, I'm, I'm going to show the rest of it. I'm just kind of interjecting to answer this question. What is the faith that is essential at this time? So let's notice what this says here. And uh, remind me your name again. Yeah, if you could read this for us, please. Pass the mic over. Uh, in the day of judgment, the course of the man who has retained the frailty and the imperfection of humanity will not be vindicated. For him there will be no place in heaven. He could not enjoy the perfection of the saints in light. He was not sufficient in faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from, from sinning. Has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. All right. Now, does this make sense to you that this is the faith that is essential at this time? It says, he who has not sufficient faith in who? In Christ. To believe that he, Christ, can keep him, me, and you, the sinners, from sinning, has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. So it's saying through the investigative judgment, the faith that is essential at this time that needs to be exercised is that Christ has the power to keep us from sinning. Does that make sense to you? All right, let's continue the statement now. Um, RJ? Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise their faith, which is essential at this time, or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. When with Daniel, every individual must stand in his lot at the end of the days. All right. I want you to notice it says here that every individual must do what? What's this word? Stand in his lot. Now this entire Sabbath school is entitled, Who Shall Be Able to, to Stand? And it's saying that how important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scenes when the judgment shall sit and a book shall be opened. When with Daniel, every individual must stand in his lot. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the scenes. We're going to look at this time. We're going to see what God expects of us and what it's going to look like when the judgment comes. Any thoughts or questions at this point? All right. Now, there's two things as God's people need to understand. How many things? Two. Number one, we just read one of them. We must understand the position and work of their great high priest. And that's what it says in Evangelism 2.21. All need a knowledge for themselves of one, the position, and two, the work of their great high priests. So in other words, what this is saying is that when Christ moved in 1844 from the holy to the most holy place, he was no longer a common priest. He was now the high priest ministering in the most holy place. And what is the object when the high priest goes into the most holy place? It's to get rid of sin altogether. Right? Mm -hmm. So it says now, as a people, we need to understand for ourselves what is the position and what is the work of our great high priest. But it only makes sense to understand the position and work of our high priest if we understand the second thing, which is we need to understand our position in our work. Notice what it says here, the subject of the sanctuary sheds great light on our present position and work. So now, as we understand what Christ is doing, then it behooves us to understand what we must be doing, right? And we must be working heart to heart with Him. What He's trying to do in heaven, we must be trying to do here on earth. The records in the books of heaven must rest to the records in our lives. And the object of the sanctuary in heaven is to cleanse the earth 
on the people on earth, rather, from all sin. All right, so the next question is, when and how can the sanctuary be cleansed and closed? Yes? Have you given them a text for that last statement? Which one? That the object is to cleanse the people. Oh, yes. The of the work in the sanctuary. Yes, let's go to uh, Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30. Right. I know where it's at. I just didn't know if you had given that. Um, make that bridge. Let, let's, let's, it's, it's good. Uh, let's look at it. I think it's... Good for us to see it in the word. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 30. Thank you, Brother Darman. Please, if you guys see any observations, as I said, I want us to get this. So ask the questions. Brother Don, we'll have you read this for us. If you can pass the mic. We have to use the mic because they're recording. Leviticus 16 and verse, uh, 30. And verse 30. Now, just to let you know, the book Leviticus 16 and, and Leviticus 23 is the Day of Atonement, right? And that's the Day of Atonement in type. We're now living in the Day of Atonement in antitype, which started October 22nd, 1844. We, we have covered that. 16 and, what? 16 and verse 30. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. From how many of your sins? From all your sins before the Lord. So the day of atonement, the high priest ministers in the most holy place because he wants to cleanse you, not from some of your sins, but from all your sins. Now this text goes with Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And he said unto me on the 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the question now is, when and how can the sanctuary be cleansed and then closed? I actually like that title, Cleanse and Close. I want to do a message called Cleanse and Close. But in the book Ransom and Reunion, many of you have it here, I like the way Frazee gives an illustration. And it's in a chapter <coughs> entitled, the cure for sin. And it's either on page 39 or 38. I have the wrong reference here. Depends on the book that you have. If you have the white book, um, I think it's on page 39. If you have the yellow book, which most of you have, it's also on page 38. The, the, the cure for sin. Yes. All right, let's, let's, let's begin to read it. Um, who are we up to? Atiano? It's on page 38. Or I have it on the screen as well. Okay. The Cure for Sin. It is Friday afternoon, and everyone scurries about getting ready. Oh, one ready. second. We, we have two seats in the front here. If you guys just mind either sliding to the left or the right. So that All right, what, what, what question are we looking to answer? You guys remember? All right. Very good. So this analogy is telling us when and how can the sanctuary be cleansed and closed. All right, Atiana. It is Friday afternoon, and everyone scurries about getting ready for Sabbath. Just now, Mother is mopping the kitchen floor. She, she's nearly finished when Mary comes in with muddy feet and runs across the floor. What will mother do now? Some more mopping if she wants a clean kitchen. Just as she gets almost through again, Johnny bursts in with muddy feet too. Now what will mother have to do? Some more mopping. When will she get through? That depends on how long the family will keep tracking in mud. All right. <laughs> you, guys, you guys get it? <laughs> All right. It continues. Ever remember that the thing which keeps Jesus in the sanctuary and delays the finishing of his work is the most holy place. In the most holy place is not the iniquity of infidels and pagans. 
The stream of sin that defiles the sanctuary comes from God's people. If we really want Jesus to come, we will confess every past sin so that he can pardon, and then we will learn from him how to quit our habitual law-breaking. All right, continue. Somebody may say, that will never be in this world. Then the sanctuary will have to stay open, unless you have found some other way to deal with the sin problem. But thank God, his plan will succeed. There will come a time when the sanctuary is cleansed Amen. and when Christ will demonstrate to all the universe that he has put away by sin by the sacrifice of himself. All right. Let me pause here and just say with great clarity. This is what holds Jesus up. We see a lot of things happening prophetically, and I believe that God and his providence is going to allow everything to align. But if Jesus was waiting on Pope Francis in the United States, he could have came in 1880, 1892, if you guys get what I'm saying. The Sunday law was about to be passed then. Um, what Jesus is waiting on more than anything else is to find the 144,000 that will live a victorious life without a mediator. That's what holds Jesus up. Satan's accusation has always been the Christ. You will never find a people that will live a victorious life. God will eventually prove Satan wrong, but he cannot prove him wrong until that people has been produced. That has been hold, the hold up. And that's why the Bible says when the fruit is ripe, immediately he put it in the sickle for the harvest has come. The harvest is not based on a set date or a set time. It's when the fruit is ripe, right? So this is the holdup. So since sin came, now just, just to think about it, you know, if, if people believe that, um, you know, God is just going to miraculously change our characters without, um, you know, without us working with him to overcome, why didn't he just do that for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Why 6,000 years later, after billions of deaths and disease and degradation and abortions and wars and strifes and diseases such as cancers and high blood pressure, all these things, why does he allow all of this if at some point he's just going to change our character for us? It just doesn't make sense. So we see that what he's waiting for is this, the point in Earth's history where he finds a people, 144,000, that is, he knows we'll live a victorious life without a mediator. And that's what we want to study as we go through the scriptures this morning. Now, as we begin to study last week, this message began to come to us between 1831 and 1844 by a man by the name of William Miller. William Miller did not fully understand what the sanctuary was. He thought the sanctuary was the earth and that God was going to come and cleanse it by fire. But then as time progressed, William Miller began to realize that Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, which is the text that he was studying, is also linked to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Revelation 14 and verse 7 says, The hour of God's judgment is come. So then he realized after a time that the judgment of God, is, it was not something that he thought just God coming to cleanse the earth by second coming by fire but that Jesus was moving from the holy to the most holy place to begin the investigative judgment. So then, after a while, William Millick began to preach, the hour of his judgment is come. Now, we mentioned that Paul in Acts 17 and Paul in Acts chapter 24 spoke of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. We mentioned that Christ in Matthew chapter 12 spoke of how every idle word that men shall speak shall, again in the future, be given account in a judgment. So, all throughout the Bible, you see that judgment was being put to the future. But when William Miller began to realize, I am now living in the time, I can now claim Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7, the hour of his judgment is come. It's not future anymore. It has come. The investigative judgment has begun. Then the world got stirred up because, of course, they were saying, you know, he was time-setting. Um, the glory covered a mistake and so on and so forth. He didn't understand the right event and so on and so forth. God stirred him up by allowing the stars to fall in 1833, when right around the time he started preaching. And then in 1844, after they realized their mistake, God didn't leave it such. 
God allowed a man by the name of Hiram Edson to have a vision. You guys remember the vision he had? He saw Christ move from the holy to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, when that happened in 1844, that began what was called the investigative judgment beginning with the dead. Now, let's go in our Bibles to see that. Revelation chapter 11. So in Revelation chapter 11, you see that in verse 1 and 2, it, it's talking about the sanctuary, how, you know, they're looking at this, John is looking at the sanctuary in heaven, and the angel is saying, measure the sanctuary, but leave out the courtyard. Why? Because there's no courtyard in heaven, right? The courtyard was here on earth. And then, as it continues now in verse 18, it says, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. What does the next phrase say? And the time of the dead that they should be judged. Right? So it kind of puts a time frame now. Then the Bible says in verse 19, so after it says the time of the dead that they should be judged, in verse 19 it says now, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament. Now, we covered this last semester, but John didn't say, I saw. John says, it was seen. Now, is there a difference between I saw and it was seen? It was seen suggests that John is saying that I see that somebody will see that the temple of God is open in heaven. You guys catch that? So in vision, John is seeing the dead is going to begin to be judged. And at the same time, I see that somebody's going to see that the temple of God is open in heaven. You guys catch that? So when, Aram Ed, when John saw that Hiram Edson saw that the temple of God was open in heaven, he saw also that the investigative judgment began and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Right? So since October 22nd, 1844, the judgment of the dead has began. How many years ago is that? Quite a long time, right? You know what Ellen White says about that? Soon, none know how soon, the judgment will pass from the cases of the dead to the living. That means once the judgment of the dead is finished, then it now begins and moves to the judgment of the living. What does that mean? That means that we could possibly be judged while we are alive. Right? Now, if, the, if you're going to be judged while you're alive, if you're going to make it through, what does that mean? That means you have to be a part of 144,000. Which means, after you're judged, you're sealed, and you still have to live a victorious life after Christ leaves heaven as our mediator. When those people are found, Christ says, now I can come. Because I'm going to prove to Satan that I can pr produce a people that can live a victorious life while they are still living. Yes, Terry. So if a person is judged and mm -hmm. they're sealed, does that mean probation is closed? It does. It does. And we're going to look at that as well. So the question is, if a person is judged while they're living, has their probation closed? Yes. But, but let me give clarity on that. Their probation is closed, but it's not the close of probation. Does that make sense to you? There's only one close of probation. I gave the analogy last semester as well. If we're, this is midterm week, right? Or testing week. There's some people that take exams earlier than others, right? And the ones that take the test, they can't go back and change the answer. Their probation is closed. 
Why? Because they've taken the exam. But that doesn't mean everyone's probation is closed because other people will be tested all throughout the week. So until everyone takes the tests, then probation has closed holistically. But while people are still testing, individual probations will be closing as they're tested, but it is not the close of probation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Uh, Russ. I've never heard this, that, that if that person is judged, then they have to be part of the 144,000. It seems like they could still die. I mean, yeah. Part of the living today. Well, well, it depends on the time. <laughs> it depends on the time frame. It depends on if it's a little time of trouble or the great time of trouble. So that is a good point. And we're, we're going to touch on that as well. We're going to put up the chart, and we're going to get to, we, we want to dig deep today. Is that all right? Yeah. And let's dig deep. All right. Any other thoughts or questions? So just remember those thoughts, and we're going to cover them. All right. So we see that the world was stirred up. Har Metzen had the vision. It was very clear. The time of the judgment began. And then when all this happens in 1844, we mentioned last week that Satan saw it, and he says, I cannot let this happen, and then Satan struck. And what did he do in 1844? What, what did he do in 1844 to strike, to say, you know what? I need to take the attention away from this because he knows, Satan knows, that once this people is produced, once Christ leaves that most holy place, his time is up. His time is very, very short, rather. And um, I think Satan's burning is going to be more tolerable for him than the millennium when he has nothing to do for a thousand years, right? So it's, uh, it's imperative that we understand the order of these events and understand the sanctuary, the investigative judgment, and how everything comes together. Yes, Brother Don. Let's get in the mic. I don't know what you're going to refer to as him striking, but I know at that time, that that time frame in history. Yep, you, have to talk, of, you have to repeat yourself now. Okay. <laughs> so I don't know what you're going to say about him, say, how Satan strikes, but in that time frame in history, the 1840s, 1850s, mm -hmm. there was a whole lot of denominations sprung That's right. up. A lot of rabbits going different directions to distract people. And That's exactly what we're talking about next. See? Bam. Mm -hmm. Religion is an opiate by Karl Marx, 1844. Do you see that Satan was afraid of 1844? And he still is. In fact, all of the attacks that has happened in the Adventist church is either directly or indirectly on the sanctuary. Either directly or indirectly on the sanctuary. Around the same time, Charles Darwin, he finished the original, original species manuscript, 1844. Same time, around that same time, Joseph Smith was assassinated. Around that same time, Darby, secret of rapture. Around that same time, um, uh, Andrew Jackson, you know, this modern, uh, the, at that time, modern spiritualist, had his first trance in March of that year. Around that same time, Saeed Ali Muhammad, the founder of the Bahi faith, had, uh, had his first vision May 22nd, 1844. So we can see that Satan was literally afraid of what was taking place in 1844. Literally. All right. Which leads to my next question. Why is Satan so afraid of the sanctuary message and the investigative judgment? Why is it that he's so fearful? Well, because when Michael stands up, the sanctuary closes, and he knows that his time is up. Now, he's still going to have that 1,000 years, but as I mentioned, I think when he gets burned up by hellfire, is a lot more tolerable than 1,000 years of not even being able to produce a blade of grass. Yes? As I'm thinking about what you're saying, I'm thinking the reason that Satan is afraid of our understanding this. The correct understanding. Correct understanding mm -hmm. of this is because we're going to go, oh, that's what's causing all the delay. That's right. And we'll get our act together. That's it. God willing. And then his time's over. So to keep us con in confusion as long as possible is to delay his demise. That's right. Now, you guys um, remember what I shared last week from Christ Object Lessons, page uh, 69. You guys remember what that says? When the... 
character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. That has everything to do with the sanctuary and the investigative judgment. All right, so we see that because when Michael stands up, he knows that the sanctuary will close and then his time is going to be very short. Now, my next question is this. When will Jesus stand up? When will he stand up? When the sanctuary is When the... Or when the, the children stop coming in with muddy feet, right? <laughs> right? So when those children stop coming in with muddy feet that Friday evening, then mommy can finally stop mopping the floor. Okay. So those muddy feet represents our sins. That mother represents Christ working in the most holy place. And when he can stop the muddy feet from coming into his house, then he says, all right, my work is finished. It behoove, does it now behoove us to say, Lord, I need to work with you? Now, now that I understand the position and work of my great high priest, it gives me a greater understanding of my position and my work. Yes. Let's get you in the mic. All right, let's say we, we understand God's work in the mm -hmm. most holy place. Let's say we understand now our work in the most holy, I mean, now what we have to do now in this, in this, uh, in this mm -hmm. earth. Now, and then for our characters to be perfectly reproduced, then Christ will come. Mm -hmm. Let's say we understand all of that. How does that look like practically? Like, do I have to, I mean, am, is it business as usual? Am I going to keep going to school and try to be a doctor and then, you know, and then just have God to try to, uh, you know, perfectly reproduce his character in me? Or is there like, is there something that is there, is, does there have to be like a, 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 a tremendous change in my life yes. that I get, I, that, that it, there's a work that I have to do, especially in this time that we're living yes. in. Do I, do, do I quit that and then go move forward with this? What is the practical application of all that? If you get what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Very you good question. All right. So. Uh, the question is, is not a simple one, but at the same time it is. And I see two other hands. But let me answer that. And uh, they feel a message last night I think was very, very timely. Um, it, it covers that with great clarity. Um, so two things. It's definitely not business as usual, right? But that's not to say that God doesn't still need doctors, right? He did say, occupy until I come, Right? But, what is the objective now of going to be a doctor? That changes. Because the reality is, you know, if, let's say in the 1800s, people got a hold of this message and everybody says, you know, I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. I'm not going to be a pastor anymore. I'm just going to only do ministry full time and not do anything that has to do with any kind of career. Well... You can see what problem you could have ran into since 1844, right? <laughs> so that's why he says, occupy until I come. But if you're going to be a doctor, what is the objective of being a doctor? Is it just to make money? Is it just to be, you know, have this prestigious position in society? Or do I understand now that I'm becoming a doctor because it's going to put me in a position best able to aid in the second coming of Christ? Yeah. I'm in a position now that I know that there's some people that will not, might not listen to a pastor, might not listen to an electrician, might not listen to, you know, a mechanic, but they'll listen to a doctor and I'm going to use my influence and my voice now to share with them about the soon coming of Christ. So from a career perspective, you know, it, it speaks on that realm. Now there are some like myself who will be called out of the normal common works of life to go into full-time ministry, but it's not everyone. So there are three kind of workers. Let me just put that up here very quickly. Uh, there's the lay worker. There's the conference worker. And then there's the self-supporting workers. What's the difference between one and three? All right. So the lay worker has a regular vocation. At time, uh, you know, they could be a mechanic, they could be a um, uh, uh, doctor. Anyone that's not a conference worker is pretty much a lay worker, and they report to a job 
pretty much nine to five or they have their own business that's committed to that and so on and so forth. So that's the lay worker. The conference worker kind of speaks for itself. They work for the conference, they're employed by the conference. That could be a Bible worker, could be a teacher, principal, uh, pastors, et cetera, et cetera. The difference now between a lay worker, to answer Brother Don's question, and a self-supporting worker is that the self-supporting worker, he might do some of the lay work activities such as, you know, um, a woodworker or such as an electronic, uh, electrical work or, or, or any one of those practical works. But like Paul, he does it so that he can ha be more capable of doing ministry. Whereas a lay worker, let's say he's working a typical nine to five, he knows that now my employment is a major part of my ministry. So as I'm working for this company or as I'm working with my own business with my own workers, it takes up the majority of my time. So I have to make sure that the clients that I meet and the workers that work for me or the workers that I work for, I'm doing my very best to introduce them to Christ. Whereas the, uh, the, the, the self-supporting worker, he might have late aspect of it, like Paul, he might build tents, make enough money so that he could go back to his mission field, if you get what I'm saying. Or it could be in such a way that like myself, I, I never had to have a, like a typical nine to five in the past 10 years, but it could be that you're, you're working for the Lord fully and by faith and works, he continued to provide for you. So the self-supporting worker supports himself in three ways. This is kind of off topic, but I guess it's, it's good for us to know. So, uh, in fact, let me put them in proper order. So one is um, services. So one is service. Um, I'm forgetting number two. It's three is donations. Number two, services. My mind is blanking. Somebody help me. Is it a sale of things? No. Books, services. Writing books. <laughs> It'll come back to me. <laughs> It'll come back to me. But anyway, so services. This is bothering me now. But, <laughs> but services. Products, 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 products. <laughs> products. <laughs> which books is a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then donations. Now, notice I have donations at the bottom. So you could have services such as, you know, I'm going to do health consultations. I'm going to do cooking classes and so on and so forth. And as you're doing a cooking class, you might have products such as, you know, health food products that you have, that you have made yourself, books that you've written or books that you've bought wholesale, DVDs that you've bought wholesale, um, different things of that nature. So the service and product supports you as a self-supporting worker. And then, you know, people might see the work that you're doing and say, you know, I've been blessed by your work. Let me contribute to your ministry. So these are the three amazing which a self-supporting worker supports himself. So the difference, um, to answer your question, Brother Dom, is in, in this case, a person might have a typical job um, and that's a part of their ministry. And in this case, they might have a typical job, but it's not full time. It's off and on. Does that make sense? Did I see another hand? Yes, uh, Brother Day. Yes, <laughs> only because they're recording, and even though your voice is nice, strong, and powerful, it will not sound well there without you it okay. for recording. Um, you mentioned Christ Object Lesson 69? Yes. Right? Uh, those of us who are a little older may remember when that was an, a particularly contentious statement, mm -hmm. um, as in Sabbath school lessons were burnt on the docks over that particular statement. Um, I like to go a few pages further in the same book, Christ Object Lessons 384, to help interpret that idea of perfectly reflecting the character of Christ. We can get so um, caught up in our efforts to be perfect that we start making distinctions between someone who eats linkets and someone who eats whatever the other brands are. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> you, can, you, can always, you can always slice it and dice it finer and finer and finer, and you can drive yourself and everyone else kind of crazy. Yes. 384, Christ Object Lessons 384. The completeness of Christian character is attained 
when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. When the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. I think that's the same thing it's talking about on page 69. Absolutely. Pre appreciate that. Um, yes, a bro a Brother Dom as well. I wanted to address RJ's question about what does this look like on the outside? And it may not, when we have uh, ceased from sin, I think that's the subject matter. Yes. Um, what's, what's different is what's happening on the inside. Motivation. Am I being motivated by my fallen nature? Or am I being motivated by Christ's divine nature? And the way I've been able to clarify that in my own mind is to understand the definition of sin. Mm -hmm. So sin is serving self. Righteousness is serving Christ. That's right. And, and sin, when I participate in sin, is when I make a conscious, well, let's see, what do I call it? Um, um, when I make a conscious choice to go the way my fallen nature is asking me to go, an intimate, consensual relationship with my fallen nature that necessarily denies Christ's presence and power to save me from making that choice. That's, that's the difference. And um, well, maybe that's enough for now. <laughs> All right, and what you just mentioned it goes in, in harmony with what Brother Fila just said. Exactly. Because, you know, if we're thinking to ourselves, you know, Victory over sin, victory over sin, victory over sin. I'm going to lock my way, myself away in this building and I'm not going to leave on this building until I get victory over sin. <laughs> then who does that point back to? Me. And sin has its foundation in self. Isaiah chapter 14 tells us how sin came into the world. Satan, I, 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 I. So sin points back to self. So going back to what Brother Felix said, you know, the balance is, is to have selfless service for others. That's the balance that God gives us. So um, going back to what we're looking at, it says, when then will Michael stand up? And it goes back to the original point that we were trying to make. Notice what it says here. Who are we up to with reading? Georgia. Now, this is a potent statement. Those living on earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease, are to stand in the sight of God without a mediator. All right, stop for a moment. <clears throat> What's this word? Living. living. All right. You guys catch that? Those living on earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease, ought to do what? Stand. And what's the question? Who shall be able to? Stand. All right. To stand in the sight of God. How? Without a mediator. That is serious business. All right, continue, Georgia. Their robes must be spotless, their characters purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. All right. Now, um, let's, uh, you know, I just love the way the spirit of prophecy in the Bible comes back full circle. All right. So the, the question that we've been looking to answer the entire semester you can see it comes back full circle now. God wants to find a people that lives in his sight without a mediator. Go ahead, Brother Gary. And then we're going to go through this timeline. Oh, well, sorry. Back to your, back to okay. your quote. We're going to come back to it. Let me just cure your curiosity by giving you the, the reference to it. It is from... GC 425.1. That or HF, whatever that stands for. 263, paragraph 2. All right, go ahead, Brother Gary. Their robes must be spotless, their characters purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling, mm -hmm. not by their actions. That's right. They do, as long as they're cooperating with God, God will do what he promises he will do. Now, so all it requires is cooperation. Everything in a sanctuary has to do with Christ and very little to do with us. You remember what we shared, the, the part that we are to sustain is immeasurably small? 
That's, that's, that was our words of inspiration, by the way. She said, the part that we are to sustain is immeasurably small. Now, the only thing that we can do is do the best we can to bring a spotless lamb. After that, we have total dependence upon the priests, right? Now, can I, can I more yes. In, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 25, mm -hmm. it says this, And if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. That's right. So what mm. this is saying is that God has outlined how we're to be saved, That's and right. we can add nothing to it. If we even try, we pollute the whole process. All right. Let's put it this way. Let's walk to the sanctuary. Who's in the courtyard? Who's the lamb? Jesus. Who's the priest? <laughs> Let's go in the holy place. What's in the holy place? Jesus. Who's, who's ministering in the holy place? Now, what are the items of furniture and the articles that's in a holy place? The bread, who does that represent? The, the, the candlesticks, who does, does that represent? So, we, and, and then we go to the altar of incense. Who do, who's ministering in that and what does that represent? So, well, you see, everything has to do with Christ, right? Now, you go into the most holy place, who's ministering? So, how are we, how are we going to be saved? By be Jesus Christ. So you can see that. Now let's begin to look at the timeline here. So we have looked at this chart. And by the way, we're looking specifically at the, those living in earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease or to stand in the sight of God without a mediator. I, Their robes must be spotless. May I please? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, can you go back, please? To the this one? Yes. Okay, so it says, through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, mm -hmm. they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. Yes. So we don't just sit idle and oh, Christ no. will do everything for us. No. It's our diligent effort in, in cooperating with him. Yes. That it will be accomplished. So two illustrations. One, John 2. In John 2, Jesus, well, Mary rather, asked them to bring uh, waters. And he says, fill up the pot to the brim. And then he turned the water into wine. Now, couldn't Jesus just say, let there be water, or let there be wine? Why did he say, bring the, the water pots and then fill them up to the brim? So he's saying, you do all that you can, do your very best, your maximum, but it's still not good enough to make any changes, right? But while you do the very best you can to put forth your maximum effort, working with me by faith, I will turn the water into wine. Same thing. We can plant a seed in the ground. We can make sure that it's watered, it's nutrients, and it's, it's, it, the soil is, has its nutrients. We can make sure it's in a place where adequate sunlight is there. We can do all that we can, but once that seed is in the ground, what can we do to get a sprout? Nothing. Nothing. Now, it's, it's not just going to get, unless it's a weed, <laughs> it's not going to sprout out unless we put a seed there, right? <laughs> so we still have to do our part, but it's still not good enough to get a sprout or a blade or a full corn in the air. We do our part, God does his part. So thanks for sharing that. All right, now, um, let's look at this chart. We'll spend more time going through it as the semester progresses, but we mentioned that this is the order of events. The straight testimony must take place. Early writings, page 269. The straight testimony causes a shaking amongst God's people. Once the shaking has taken place, there are three phases of the shaking. What are they? Heresies. What else? Straight testimony and persecution. persecution. So then it leads to the seal of God and or the mark of the beast, or, or rather not and, seal of God or the mark of the beast. And this is all in the little time of trouble. Then the people of God receive the latter rain, give the loud cry, and the loud cry takes us to the close of probation. Now why does the loud cry stop at the close of probation? Right. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. So there's no one else that's going to be saved, so the loud cry will be of no benefit. The destinations are sealed. What yes, Terry? Um, 269. All right. So then, after the close of probation, you enter into the, the seven last plagues, and that's now the great time of trouble. Within the last, seven last plagues, you have Jacob's time of trouble. And then we want to take a look now at the close of probation and the seven last plagues. Ten minutes. Let's see if we could do it. All right. So now what happens 
when Michael stands up? What happens when Michael stands up? Every case is decided. All right. Now, one of the things you want to notice is whenever the Bible mentions Michael, you want to think war, probation closing, judgment, right? So Michael and Stang is associated with war, judgment, and the close of probation. A perfect example. I won't read them for the sake of time. Mark 16. When you read Mark 16 and verse 19, it says, And Jesus went to heaven pretty much and sat at the right hand of God. You guys remember that, right? Then in Acts chapter 7, now Stephen is being stoned. And as Stephen is being stoned, what event was also taking place? Judgment, Judgment or probation. probation for the Jews. And when Stephen is now given his last message, what did he say? He saw Michael, uh, he saw Jesus rather, standing. 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 Judgment, etc., etc. So when you go to Daniel chapter 12, now it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. That means you have to think. War, judgment, close of probation. Does that make sense? Yes, yes Gary. Well, I, I'm have to. Is it quick? Because I, I want to well, round off these points before we close up. Um, Isaiah three thirteen. Yeah, go ahead. It it basically said God stands to judge the people. Very good. Isaiah three thirteen. Thirteen. You guys got that? Powerful. Isaiah three thirteen. God stands to judge the people. All right. So when Michael stands up, or when we read about standing, we know that there's judgment, close of probation, war, strife, etc., etc., right? Now let's go to Revelation chapter 7. So what we want to do is prove in the, in the Bible that God is going to produce a people that stands without a mediator in a time of judgment. Thanks for that text, Gary. All right. So Revelation 7, verse 1 through 4. Are we there? Now let's, let's notice what it says. And after these things I saw how many? Four angels doing what? Staying on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So question. Where were the winds to blow? Earth, sea, and tree. All right. Let's keep that in mind. And then it goes on. It says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having what? The seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, Till we have sealed the servants of our God, where? In their foreheads. So the next question is, when is this taking place? What are these winds? And, uh, and when these winds are blowing, what does that mean? Let's go over to Revelation chapter 16. What is in Revelation chapter 16, by the way? It's the seven last plagues, right? And I want you to notice what it says in verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the, on the earth. Right? Verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the, on the sea. Do you guys see the connection? Yeah. So this tells us now that Revelation 7, when those angels stands up with the four winds, that's the same time as the seven last plagues. Do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. uh, it says in the plain language in the spirit of prophecy, but I want you to see it in the Bible first. All right. So just keep that in mind that it's the same time frame. It's the same time frame when Michael stands up. 
Same fine frame of Revelation chapter 7, seven with the four angel with the four winds. It points right back to Revelation chapter 16. Now, what does the 144,000 receive to protect them in this time of trouble? So they receive the seal of the living God. The question then is, what is the seal? Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads. It is not any mark, seal or mark that can be seen, but what is it? Tell me. A settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. What's the last of it say? Read it with me. So they cannot be moved. You guys catch this? So when these 144,000 receive this seal, they are settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that they cannot be moved. It's the same time when Michael stands up, which means that they're going to be so settled that even after Michael stands up and probation closes, they're going to be still sealed by God and they're not going to be moved. So what am I saying? God is saying that there's going to be a people that is going to produce, that stand through the great time of trouble and the little time of trouble. And they're going to be so settled intellectually and spiritually that they will not be moved. And we know that 144,000 will not see death. In fact, Ellen White said the living saints, the 144,000 in the book, Early Writings. All right. So notice what it says here now. The four angels with the winds. Any questions on that? All right, notice what it says here. Then I saw that Jesus could not leave the most holy place until every case was decided either for salvation or destruction. And that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place, laid off his priestly attire and clothed himself with his garments of vengeance. What's the next word? Amen. Then Jesus will step out from between the Father and man. And God will keep silence no longer but pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his truth. He will stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and what's the next word? Then the seven last plagues will be poured out. So you, you can kind of see the timing. Everything ties right back together. Daniel 12, 1, Revelation 7, and Revelation chapter 16. Same time frame. All right. Yes. Uh, early writings, page 36. Now watch what she says next. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary and then will come the seven last plagues. Now, as I said, Ellen White shares it in plain language, but we also want to see it in the Bible, right? So as you go through the Bible's timeline, you see that everything comes together. All right, let me share a few more statements. We'll close and then we'll do a recap next week because I know I'm going fast. Mm -hmm. Notice what it says here. It goes back to the statement now. Those living on earth, when the intercession of Christ shall cease, are to stand in the sight of God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless, their characters purified from sin by the blood of the sprinkling. Through two things, the grace of God and what else? Their own, their own diligent effort. They must be conquerors in the battle with evil. Then it goes on. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of the penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of putting away sin among God's people on earth. Now watch what this says. This is, the, this is presented in the message of what? Revelation chapter 14. So everything that I'm sharing with you is right in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? It's none other than the three angels' messages, and it's all about Christ trying to reproduce his character and his people. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. So it's saying now that you know that the hour of God's judgment is come, what do, does God want us to do? Fear God and give glory to him. So since 1844, October 22nd, God's judgment hour has come, and as God's people, our object is to fear God and give glory to him. And what is God's glory? His character. Then it goes on. When this work shall be accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Then 
the church, which our Lord at his coming is to receive, will be a what? Glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. All right, I'm going to stop here. I'm tempted to go a little bit further, but I'm going to stop here. <laughs> All right, any quick questions before we close out? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I, I mean, I could put it back up for you to take a picture, or I could see if I could print, print it out and bring it next week as well. Let me close off by saying this. Um, there's a, let's go back to what I start off with in Hebrews six. Wherefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let's go on unto perfection.